Firstly, I'd like to thank the organizers of this session for inviting me to speak, and uh, secondly, for everyone managing to survive an entire day of 23 papers so far. <laughs> it's a lot. Um, yeah, so uh, there's a map in my region. I constantly forget when I go into international conferences to put maps in and assume that people know wh what I'm doing. Um, this uh, is a map of the Diocese of Tune in the west of Ireland. Um, it's uh, a strange kind of place to pick for talking kind of urbanisation and stuff because uh, even to this day it's not, it's not what most people wouldn't consider an urban uh, environment. Um, there are no Viking emporia or towns in the area. Um, the, the sources and, uh, and the archaeology seems to show that this is a much poorer area than then um, the east of the country, where you have um, the royal sites of Lake Tara and, and Le Gore Crown Oak, which, um, which really show that there's a dichotomy in wealth between the west and the east of the country. So my methodologies have been, just a very quick run through, uh, using Carl Polanyi substantivist as a, as a point of departure. There are some problems with some of the sites, but um, it's it's a good point. It's a good point, point for me to use, um, linking the economics with the social structures. Uh, Claude Monsieur and Gramsci is the Marxist kind of talking about the superstructure and how power structures inter interact with the people living in these in the landscape. And finally, the the long durée, uh, and at least uh, way just to because. While early medieval Ireland is quite lucky in that we have a lot of uh, textual sources, um, the corpus of texts on the actual economy are quite sparse. Um, the main thing we have are the, the law tracts. And the problem with the law tracts is simply that there's a debate over how applicable they were to the reality of, of, of the time. So as I said, um, the west of Ireland doesn't have any of the Viking Emporia. Um, this is a site that was excavated by Fimber McCormack and Emily Murray in the early 2000s. Uh, Dunlachton in the, the very, very western tip of, of Connemara in County Galway. Uh, it was used as a seasonal site for about a, about a hundred years before the, the Vikings came. Um, the ring, ring pin shows the kind of the importance of it as a as a site. Um, I think Torben was talking about fish bones and survival of fish bones. Um, they have found uh, eel eel bones, which um, they've linked that to the, the migration of the eels, and can see that this was a, a site that was occupied between about March and August. Um, there are several sites in the area. As well, that have um, that are uh, that have Norse connections. I won't call it Norse settlement, but presence anyway. Um, just up the way from it, just uh, just on the other side of this bay up here, uh, there's a uh, a Viking warrior grave with the full weapons assemblage, and um, there is uh, several. Viking farmstead, Viking age farmsteads in the area. Um, there's a few place names. Uh, one of which is uh, Truska, which uh, it's argued has been as argued and the argument still going on uh, that it's uh, translated that Trusk in Irish is, is cod, and that this is one of the reasons why the Vikings came to the region in the first place. Um, one of the Explanations for this site has been that it was basically used as a um, place of production, production and distribution for the uh, island-based uh, ecclesiastical settlements, of which there are many, including two on Inishbofin, uh, one on Omi Island, uh, and several more. Inishbofin also has a, a large deposit of soapstone, uh, which may, may have been one of the reasons why the Vikings ended up settling there. 
So metalworking. Um, so those of you who read my other paper will know will see these will have seen these photos before. Um, uh, Andreas was talking about how um, metalworking sites that were kind of at the same point or uh, occupied the same point and used and used at the same point uh, can still be quite different. Um, the one on the left is a place called Bofino, uh and. Uh, it's an artificial island, a Cron Oak, um, that was occupied in well, the 9th century. Um, the use of the need for water in London is, is one of the reasons that it was uh, put in the middle of the lake. However, it would have been much easier if they had just built it on the lake shore. And there's a. The literary texts show that the, 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 the blacksmith was given almost magical properties. And we were talking also about multi-metal sites uh, at Low Park as well, but uh, in the law tracks it says that um, the metal worker is only allowed to obtain the metal for which he is an expert. Whether this is anything to do with magic or simply to do with uh, control of, of, of the substances, uh, I don't know. Uh, Low Park is... Uh, on the nor very northern edge of my of my territory, it's um, a site that is in, in use for several hundred years, and you can you can see the social status of the people who are who are in the uh, go up and up and up as the the house the houses are uh, torn down and rebuilt in a in a larger sense. Um, and here you find uh, both iron and gold being worked. Now I didn't uh, find a um, measurement for the piece of gold there, but it's about the size of a one ten coin. Um, and it's the reconstruction done by um, Neve Whitfield, uh, who came up to the site and was uh, very much surprised um, because there is this one from the Crown Oak Royal Site at the Low Park, as you see, it's quite similar. Um, the the especially the, the the central piece, which may have been adorned with the with the, a stone of a precious stone of some sort. So there are many reasons that this might be simple. I mean, the simplest one is that we have only found that that, that these fashion these fashions were much more widespread, and we're just finding these. Um, because of course a lot of gold was melted down. Um, either that or itinerant worker who goes between both sites, or there's a workshop based in Low Park or one in, in Lagor. Um, someone suggested that it's a, a gift exchange between two magnates, two uh, petty kings. Um, it, it could be anything really. So yes, yeah, silver hordes, and this is where again, once again, the dichotomy of wealth between the west and the east of the country is is shown. Um, the as you see, there, there's only one from my study area, um, although I think there's one now as well that's been in Sligo at Knox Park, uh, where an Arabic dirham was found. Um, so the distribution actually is is, is quite is quite uh, striking. Uh, they're all based a lot in bogs, rivers, around the coastline, so basically anywhere to do with water. Um, so it's uh, whether the idea, whether the, whether it was purely Vikings or the Irish themselves who were, who were burying it, it's, it's hard to say. Um, Loch Enel is a, is a good site. Um, there, it's just here, as you can see, you can't actually see the lake at all uh, because there are so many silver hordes uh, based around it. Um, there's two crown oaks uh, and uh, quite a lot of silver, which shows the the, 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 the growing wealth of not only uh, not in the region but also Ireland in general. Uh, another kind of dichot another kind of comparison or contrast is that 
the, the vast majority of the coins that have been found in Silver Horse in Ireland are actually uh, found in the east of the country. It shows its, its, its relationship to the, to, uh, to, um, the, uh, to Anglo-Saxon England and to um, the continent in general. Um, and you don't see that much in, in um, the West, although that one in my study area, Kushlagarth, is, is quite, uh, it's quite a large uh, find of hack silver that was found on the beach in the 1930s by a man farming. Um, so yeah. So how do people get around? Um, this is a slightly adapted thing that I did on Microsoft Paint. Um, the the Schli Assel there, the one that the one that I've kind of extended. Most of the other roads, ways in Ireland, as you can see, reach some form of coastline, such as the ones that go towards the west. And for some reason, the Schli Assel has been considered that it it, it only reached Rachrachan in what kind of Roscommon. But the roadway further on, going towards uh, Crowpatrick in the west, uh, was significant even into the 16th century when the English army uses it to uh, put down a rebellion. Um, again, the law tracts talk of uh, five types of, of, of roadways. Uh, Schli, which is basically uh, which would allow two horse carts to pass side by side and they go all the way down to a, a boar. Boar being the Irish word for cow and basically just being a, a, a small path for, for driving cattle. Um, the Shlee Moor follows the Escarita. Um, Eskers were, were uh, a quite easy way to get around. Uh, glacial deposits uh, raised above what is in the centre of the country, in the west of the country, quite boggy land and to do with the uh, the economy there is an argument over whether the, the roads converge at Tara or at Dublin Tara being the spiritual home of Irish kingship and Dublin being the predominant economic hub of the of the Viking period in Dublin in Ireland so the role of the church um, Viking raids as I said um, the Vikings that were in the west of Ireland uh, raided the uh, monasteries of the islands quite frequently um, settled there for a while uh, of course I hadn't mentioned monastic workshops either um, which is uh, two okay. um, so Paul Stevens is doing work on Clonard and handbells and has shown that the distribution is quite quite even around the, the centre of the country and um, I don't know if many of you are familiar with the debate over the monastic towns, whether, whether the monasteries were towns or not. Um, it tends to be that those who are, who are advocating for it tend to use the texts. Uh, they use the word kivitas uh, for, uh, for monasteries, and those that are not tend to use the archaeology, but that's not always, that's possibly an oversimplification. Um, <laughs> As well as this is a high cross at Down Patrick. Uh, high crosses were um, often used to delineate between uh, the secular part of an ecclesiastical settlement and the more and the more uh, ecclesiastical one. Um, yeah, so the change in nature of exchange, the commodification of 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 uh, of, uh, of of metal, another another. Uh, and other um, crafts, uh, the growth of the Viking Emporia, but not only the ones that the Viking ones, but also the, the native Irish ones, and the development of social relations, how the increasing wealth uh, was um, helped to uh, put more, the more power in the hands of fewer people and ended up with the uh, provincial kind of kingship that we have and leading to Brian Baru and, and the O'Connor kings uh, in, enforcing their legitimacy uh, on the on majority of the country. Thanks.